So uh, I'm going to introduce you Simone, but just before that, let me take the opportunity. We have uh, here, by chance, both Silvia and Mariano and our chief organizer, so let's thank them. Okay, and uh, well, of course, I'm super happy to, to leave uh, the floor to Simone. Ah, okay. I, I was thinking you were going for a speech. I was like, oh my. No. I mean, no, no, no. It's, uh, likewise. So, okay, so the title is up there, Convexity and Risk. Let me make just one minute uh, premise. Um, first of all, I would just like to say that uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's uh, also an honor and the environment is just fantastic. So, super happy. The second part of my premise is the following one. This is going to be a bit uh, of an unorthodox talk for, under two, for two reasons. It is not, it's not a lecture, it's too short, it's too cram, and also I'm presenting some new research. So it's not going to even be a, a research seminar. That's why it's going to be a little bit unorthodox. Unorthodox also in the sense that when I will present some very historical result, I will present it through the lenses that I decide to present the new research. Okay, with. So it's going to be a bit, uh, okay, as I said, unorthodox. Uh, let me just add, and then I'll start, that the new research I will be discussed toward the end of this talk comes from an old paper of mine, Cerea Viola 2009, and a new research project, a new paper that I have joined, joined with David Dillenberger at UPenn and Pietro Toleva uh, at Columbia now. So, without further ado, Today I'll be talking about choices under risk. What is the problem of choice under risk? Mathematically, uh, it's, a, it's a binary relation over a set of probability measures. But why do we care from an economics point of view? Well, because we consider a decision maker who has preferences over probability distribution. But again, why probability distributions? Because in economics and finance, we decide, or it was decided that to model certain objects of interest, probability distributions were the best object available or the best approximation. So for example, to model the value of an asset, imagine the value of a stock, or the value of an investment, so think of an oil well, or the behavior of an opponent, or a mixed strategy, okay? Or mixed actions, for example, in Fabio's stock. And at least, for the value of an asset, so assets, investments, or strategies are objects, actions, are objects that a decision maker can choose over, okay? So that's why I might have preferences over probability distributions. How do we formalize a situation of choice under risk? What are probability distributions? Well, probability distributions are already well-defined mathematical objects, but here, just to be precise, Let's consider C, a set of consequences. Typically, it's assumed that it is a subset of, a, it, typically it is assumed it is a compact metric space. I will present an example in just one slide, two examples actually. And probability distribution, well, we model them to be all the possible Borel probability measures over C. This is the set over which the decision maker is assumed to have preferences. Um, just a tiny piece of notation, P, Q, and R, little p, little q, and little r, will denote from now on elements of delta, probability, uh, probability measures. I will also refer equivalently to lotteries. What is a lottery? It's just a probability measure, okay? But this is the jargon that decision theorists and economists are more accustomed to. So examples of, of set of consequences. Well, assume C is a finite set. Okay, it's a finite set of prices. Well, then delta becomes a, the simplex of R to the C. Maybe a more transparent economics example. Assume that C is a bounded closed interval, WB of R. So it represents amounts of money. Remember, the value of an investment, for example, the value of a stock. Uh, WB, the choice uh, is just to remind worst outcome, best outcome, okay? Uh, in this tutorial, we will focus on the latter, which is a special but very important case, okay? Example of choice of consequences. Clearly, or let me say, maybe not clearly, most of the theory I'm going to discuss can be carried over in a much more general setting, when C has no 
you know, is just a compact metric space, as I said. So, a bit of mathematics. Uh, by CWB, I denote the space standard notation of continuous functions over the closed and bounded interval WB. And this set is endowed with the subnorm. Maybe, hopefully, I'll be able to discuss a sketch of a proof of an important result just to show you that it can be decision theory can also be mathematically interesting. So that's why I'm discussing this object. Define calligraphic V to be a subset of the space of continuous functions, but in V you just put the continuous functions that are increasing and normalize, uh, and normalize on the best consequence to one, okay? On the other end, calligraphic Q norm def defines the set of continuous functions that are strictly increasing, the S is for strictly increasing, and that are also, I would say, normalized. That is, to the worst outcome, they give value zero, and to the best outcome, they give value one. Uh, just an observation in terms of notation. Maybe this is not the best choice of notation for a talk, but it's also very close to the papers I'm going to present. So if you are curious and you will go to these papers, then the notation will be familiar, okay? Uh, I will call often continuous functions over WB, also Bernoulli utility functions. It will become clear in a while why I will do so. Uh, by CAWB, I denote the space of all finite Borel sign measures, okay? And uh, notice that CAWB is the norm dual of the space of continuous functions, and we endow this set with the weak star topology. If you do not know what the weak star topology is, and if we have time, I'll try briefly to discuss what it is when we discuss the sketch of a proof. And just notice that, uh, well, we endow delta with the relative topology. Fact, delta is convex and compact. That's all the mathematics I think I'm gonna discuss. So now, going back to the economics problem. What are preferences? I told you the object of choice, but how do we model preferences? Well, we model preferences as binary relations on delta, okay? And we interpret P being in relation with Q, I will say P squiggle Q as P being declared weakly better than Q. Strict denotes the asymmetric part, which we interpret as strict preference. Tilde denotes the symmetric part, which we interpret as usual as indifference. The first object that is of interest for economists, a utility function. Why is of interest? Because, well, we assume that the behavior of agents is rational, so they maximize their preferences. But maximizing preferences can be very hard. On the other hand, optimization in mathematics tells us that, you know, give us several techniques on how to maximize a function. So for such a reason, typically economists are focused on utility, focus on utility functions. So given a binary relation on delta, what is a utility function of or for squiggle is a function that allows me to represent the binary relation squiggle. That is, P is weakly better than Q if and only if the value associated to v by V to P is greater or equal than the value associated to Q. If I know the value given to P and Q by V, then I will know the preference of the decision maker. I would also say that V represents squiggle. Not each binary relation emits a utility function, okay? Um, notice, this is important, and from a conceptual point of view, that these numbers, that is the one that V gives to a lottery P, are not important per se. They are ordinal concepts. So it's a, v captures is just an ordinal object, in the sense that if I multiply V by 400, it does, anyway, this job, that is represented squiggle. So I do not attach to the unit of V any particular meaning. Now, clearly I said this, but then I'll try to convince you that for choice under risk, there are particular normalization that are important, that is that they have a cardinal meaning. But they will come with time. Let's go back one second. Well, we were already in the economics realm. Uh, which property do we require the binary relation to satisfy? Which property do we impose on our decision maker? Well, in economics, particularly in a, in a situation of choice or 
of the choice and the risk with monetary lotteries, that is with probability measures over monetary outcomes, these are seen as key tenets of rationality. So pre-order, squiggle is reflexive. You declare P at least as good, weakly better than P itself, okay? And transitivity. Those are, this also is seen as a, rush, as a tenet of rationality. That is, if P is weakly better than Q and Q is weakly better than R, you better declare P weakly better than R. In a, in a situation of choice under risk with monetary lotteries, this is also seen as an assumption of rationalities. So, Player Pier Paolo asked this clarifying, this clarifying question already on Monday, just everybody on the same page. Delta, delta denotes the probability distribution that gives you with probability one, x, delta x, okay? It's the Dirac at x, and delta y is the Dirac at y. So with monotonicity it says that x greater or equal than y, if and only if the decision maker prefers to receive x for sure over receiving y for sure. An economist would say more money is better than less money. I see it also as a tenets of rationality. If you do not, we can do some business together and we will be both happy. So those are key tenets of rationality over monetary lotteries. Continuity, this is more of a technical assumption. Um, I will just read it out loud, but again, the appeal of this assumption is more of, um, it has more of a technical flavor. Consider two sequences of lotteries, PN and QN. If you can, if PN is weakly better than QN for all N, then PN better than QN for all N, then at the limit, if PN goes to P and QN goes to Q, the preference should say that P is weakly better than Q. Intuitively, this assumption is capturing the following idea. The decision maker's preferences does not change, does not have a big change for small changes in the prospects that are getting evaluated. Are there, are there other assumptions of continuity? Yes, do they look any better? It depends on the setting. This one allows me to encompass all the models I want to discuss today, okay? Uh, oh, very well, the first model. So, just quick references. The expected utility model was proposed by von Neumann and Morgerst in 1944, but it has an important predecessor. Uh, in, uh, as a result, in Nagumo Kolmogorov Definetti. I say sealed, so Ardi Little Vudepolia for, I should add, for a textbook treatment of the subject, okay? I will, it will be clear what I have in mind as this being a predecessor of this result. Why Ersten and Milner? Milner is an important film analyst, by the way, uh, because basically nowadays formulation of the expected utility in terms of axiomatization is substantially the one proposed by Ersten and Milner, or also Jensen, 1969, right? Very well, so what is expected utility? Let's treat it from a normative point of view to start with. So we said more money better than less money. So let's start to consider a function V that is strictly increasing over the monetary outcomes. How should I evaluate, uh, how should I evaluate a probability P? Well. I look at the consequences it gives me, they are in WB, I compute V of X, the value of the consequence, and then I average them out by using the lottery, the probability that I'm evaluating. This is a criterion that could be more or less uh, meaningful, okay, it has an appeal, it's something we know, it's like an expected value basically. So a decision maker, here notice, could rank lotteries, so it generates a, a preference by using this particular utility function, or it could act as if it's using this particular utility function, okay? So it's a, mini, it's a proposal, let's say. Equivalently, we said once we have a utility function, any monotonic transformation will generate the same binary relation. So let's look at this normalization. We can consider our function u, the expected utility I defined before here, and we could, could normalize it by taking the inverse, okay? By composing it with the inverse of the little function v. This is also called a certainty equivalent. Why is that? Notice that I, the codomain of capital V is WB, okay? So basically, 
This normalization allows me to translate each evaluation for each lottery into the same units of account of the consequences, okay? And in particular, it tells me that the value of a Dirac is the point over which the Dirac is defined, okay? So it has an economic meaning, this normalization. It translates everything into the same unit of accounts. Remember Nagumo, Kolmogorov, and Netti. What did they do? They studied functional, basically we could say, over delta, that can be characterized in the following way, as certainty equivalent of an expected utility function, okay? So that's why, in a sense, it's a predecessor of von neumann morgenstern result. And here I just noticed what I just told you, that U, the expected utility function, and V, the certainty equivalent induced by the expected utility, induce the same binary relation. But at the end, you know, the primitive of the problem is a binary relation, and we care to know if the decision maker with his binary relation acts as if the, an expected utility guy. It's not the other way around, okay, at least from a descriptive point of view. So, we care to see what are the, yeah, yeah. For a second, just okay. not just down just that. Yeah. What he's saying is that if that criterion is used, then lottery P is indifferent to the Dirac on V minus one of U of P. So you get this money for sure, and this is going to be equivalent to the. Sorry, okay. Simone, for interrupting. Yeah. Just for very good. So again. Uh, now the goal is to understand what are the tenets, the behavioral tenets, behind the expected utility criteria, okay? So let's look at the, fo at the following two, okay? Clearly, they will be part of this exercise. Completeness. Well, completeness is saying that whenever you present two lotteries to the decision maker, he's able to tell you if P is weakly better than Q or Q is weakly better than P, okay? Independence, on the other end, is telling you that consider three lotteries, P, Q, and R, and a mixing weight lambda. If P is weakly better than Q, then any mixture involving P should be declared better than any mixture involving Q. When the third lottery, the mixing lottery, and the mixing weight lambda and R are common. So basically, the evaluation of a mixture is independent on the common part. That's why independence. So first result, von Neumann, the celebrated von neumann morgenstern result. A decision maker acts as if he is an expected utility guy, if and only if he satisfies pre-order and weak monotonicity, the key tenets of rationality I discussed at the beginning. Continuity, the following technical assumption, and the two assumptions I discuss now, completeness and independence, okay? Moreover, V, this Bernoulli utility function, is unique up to an affine transformation, okay? Uh, do you know what, uh, an affine, uh, what it means to be unique up to an affine transformation? No? So let's say, let's discuss it. It basically means that if I find two little v's that do the job. What does it mean to do the job? It means that they represent, through the expected utility functional, the same binary relation. Then, they might differ, but not so much, in the sense that v1 is a multiple of v2, plus a constant, okay? So, another way of saying it is that this is, they are basically cardinally unique. It's like Celsius and Fahrenheit. Once you know Celsius, you can go back Fahrenheit through, an affine, through a positive and affine operation, and vice versa, okay? So this is what it means to be unique up to an affine transformation. Okay, very good. Nevertheless, we can even say more in terms of, un in terms of uniqueness, and then I'll be, I'll be I will tell you why do we care so much about uniqueness. If we focus on representations that are also normalized, that is that they give value zero to the worst outcome and one to the best outcome, then we would have full-fledged uniqueness. There would be just one utility, one little v, 
that does the job, okay? Why do we care so much about uniqueness? We care so much about uniqueness because in two or three slides, we will attach, we will show, or we, I will argue, that V captures some behavioral aspects, okay? Something that is pertinent to the preferences of the decision maker. For example, I basically will argue that V, the little function V, is an index of risk aversion, okay? So why do we care for it to be unique? Because otherwise I would have an agent that I can characterize with two indexes of risk aversion, two potentially different indexes of risk aversion. And this conceptually is not satisfactory. That's why decision theorists care so much. Or, yeah, yeah, yes. I feel already free. Those who have studied, uh, you know, Intermediate micro have learned that there is an index of risk aversion which is invariant to find transformations. We will see. Okay. It will, it will come. I did a bit my own work, yes. Yes, quickly. What, what happens if we drop completeness and put some non degeneracy? Also, there I did my own work and we will see. We will see. I, thanks for asking, is exactly the path I'm going to take, okay? So just observe that again. If I compose the expected utility with the inverse of the Bernoulli utility function, I still represent the same binary relation, but this utility evaluation is again in dollars or euros, okay? So it's in the same unit of accounts of the space of consequences. What does this definition say? I, today, I baptize a binary relation, an expected utility binary relation, if and only if it satisfies these actions. That is, it admits an expected utility representation. That's all. Risk attitudes. So here I just noticed five minutes before coming here that I didn't mention Arrow 1965. So this is a shortcoming of mine. But really, three basic references. Pratt, what does Pratt do? It tells you that what we will see being com risk attitudes are captured by the curvature of the function V. What do I mean by curvature? Economies with curvature mean concavity and convexity, okay, of the little function V. Yari, Yari is, at the best of my knowledge, the first uh, to propose the modern notion of comparative risk attitudes, we will see. While on the other hand, uh, Rothschild Stiglitz, are basically responsible for characterizing a uh, different notion, let's say, of risk aversion within the expected utility model. And also this, we will see it in few slides. So, for each P in delta, denote by EP the expected value of P, okay? Notice that this definition is model free, that is it applies for any binary relation as much as the following one. When do we say that the decision maker is risk averse? If and only if, he prefers to receive for sure the expected value of a lottery rather than taking part in the lottery itself. Just to give you, just to see what I have in mind, consider the following two lotteries. This one pays you one million with probability 50% and 0% with probability 50%. This one instead gives you for sure 480,000. For example, if you ask me, I have no doubt that I will take you, okay? So Q strictly prefer to P, but the expected value of P is 500,000, okay? So receiving 500,000 for sure is strictly better because there's more money involved than receiving 480 for sure, which I just declare strictly prefer to P. This tells you that I am risk averse at P, but in general, when the behavior is global, then you have risk aversion. For example, risk averse is a guy like me. This I won't discuss formally, it's the only thing that I don't even have an Eden's life for, the notion of mean preserving spread. There's a notion coming from statistics that tells you that one binary relate, one, sorry, one probability distribution is more dispersed than another. We will say that Q is more dispersed than another by say, than P, than saying that Q is a mean preserving spread than P. They have the same mean, but one is more dispersed than another. So I will denote it with the binary relation P squiggle mean preserving spread Q. By saying, with this I mean Q is more spread than P. We say that the risk of a decision maker is a mean preserving spread averter, that is, it doesn't like mean preserving spread, whenever 
This is the case. If Q is a mean preserving spread of P, he prefers P, he prefers P to Q. That's it. So Rothschild Stiglitz, the first two were behavioral notion. In, that is in terms of risk preferences, in terms of preferences. Squiggle is risk averse, squiggle is mean preserving spread averter. Well, within the expected utility realm, these two behavioral notions are equivalent to the concavity of V, remember, the curvature, okay? And they are also equivalent among themselves, between themselves, okay? So this is a version of Rothschild Stiglitz. But this, what we just discussed, we are discussed about absolute risk attitudes. That is, risk attitudes with just one decision maker. But for example, I would like to understand if Pierpaolo is more risk averse than me. It's the other way around, actually. I'm more risk averse than Pierpaolo. But uh, how do we define this? Well, notice even this definition is model free. Consider two binary relations, squiggle one and squiggle two. And Yari will tell you that we can declare one being more risk averse than two, if and only if, whenever one chooses uncertainty over certainty, also two does the same. In other words, Pierpaolo is less risk averse than me. He sees me that I go for the bet rather than the sure outcomes, and so he says, if even Simone, that you know, he doesn't cross the street because he's scared, chooses P over delta X, then I'm, I'm gonna do the same, okay? Sorry, can I just yeah. ask curiosity about yeah. the concavity analysis? Uh, I had in mind Jensen's inequality. That, does it come it, after, it, it's, uh, is it after it, or before the? The Jensen inequality is the workhorse behind this result, basically. So it's uh, the, what you use to prove this result and what you use to prove uh, this equivalent to this. This instead is a bit more involved, okay? So yes, your intuition is definitely correct. And in fact, as Heike was uh, hinting at, now we can also characterize in terms of representation, squiggle one and squiggle two being one more risk averse than the other within the expected utility realm. So this translates into saying that the utility, the Bernoulli utility function of one is more concave than the utility function of two. That is, V1 is a strictly increasing continuous and concave transformation of V2. Okay, very good. Let's move on. In a so, for example, if you read Auman 1962, I just had a look this morning. Uh, I was surprised in a sense, uh, because he says, okay, arguably the most questionable assumption behind the expected utility model is completeness. You will see why I'm surprised. In a nutshell is because I would say that in the past 20, 30 years, the entire profession devoted itself, in the vast majority of the profession, to weaken the independence assumption. But he was saying the most questionable assumption, arguably, is completeness. So the first thing we will do is to remove completeness, okay? Uh, we will be following Dubra Maccheroni e Hoc, uh, not because Fabio is my friend or I like him a lot, it's really a very nice result. Uh, and uh, so basically Aumann was concerned with a different problem, but he was the father of a concept that they exploit, the Aumann cone. This actually is the result that if I have time, I would like to discuss the sketch of the proof. So Dubra Maccheroni Hoc we're gonna follow, so you will see what it's going to be about. Bausseles and Shapley is basically very similar uh, for the result I'm discussing to Dubra Maccheroni Hoc. It's done in a more particular setting and uh, with less, uh, I would say, clear-cut assumptions. So what is the result? Here the result does what I promised, the least in terms of axiomatization, just dropping completeness. What is the characterization? Well, you satisfy all the expected utility assumptions, but completeness, if you are represented like by the expected utility criteria, but not by just using one Bernoulli utility function, by having a set of Bernoulli utility functions, okay? So basically, it is as if you are Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You have several cells, and you can declare P prefer to Q if and only if all your cells unanimously say that P is better than Q. Notice that this also can be seen as saying squiggle representing the decision of a committee. Suppose it's me, Fabio, Mariano, we are all standard guys, standard for an economist, that is, we are expected utility, 
but you just observe the decision of the committee eventually and say that the, sometimes the committee does not reach a, a, a conclusion. Okay? Well, we satisfy as a committee all the assumption of von Neumann Morgenstern but completeness if we are exactly an, a unanimity, we follow a unanimity expected utility rule. What about uniqueness here? Here, let me just say that the uniqueness is different than the one you look in the paper uh, that we, you can find in the paper of Fabius, but for a good reason, the result I'm gonna discuss next. If you force yourself to look just at functions that are strictly increasing and normalized, then this set W is unique up to the closed convex hull. What do I mean with that? If you find a set W1 that satisfy this relation and a set W2 that they satisfy this relation, if you take their closed convex hull, you get the same set, okay? So once you convexify it and you close it, you get the same set. Yes? How many functions in W? How many functions in W? Functions in w? Okay, so let me answer in, uh, let me answer in the, I think in, in a way that could be I think satisfactory for you. If you want to know, for example, if W is finite, okay, then I can refer you to a paper of F.A. Hock, Fabius co-author, that exactly deals with this problem. Uh, typically, these results are really hard to achieve, that is to prove that this set is finite. And if I remember correctly, this paper of F.S. does exactly this job. Potentially, uh, well, clearly there is a relation. The more you are incomplete, the bigger is W. For example, if you, can, if you are just reflexive, allow me to say this, then your set of utility functions is the, and uh, given the monotonicity assumption, is the set of all strictly increasing function, and you are first order stochastic dominance. You are the first order stochastic dominance relation. On the other end, if you are complete, that set collapses to one point, okay? So in the, mean, in the, mid, uh, you, in the middle, you have all the possible configuration. If you want to know, theorems that tells you if you have assumption A, then you have this cardinality. I do not know them, I just know I don't think they exist either. I think though that there exists uh, uh, this version of F that proves that under certain assumption is W can be seen as the closed convex hull of a finite set of utilities. We call, yeah. yeah. It's a very similar question. Um, yeah. Is there any way of partitioning W uh, and imposing some kind of natural analog of, of scale transform, of affine transformations on the on partition cells such that you could say any partition is an affine transformation. Of them. Okay, so uh, let me see if I understood your question. So for example, the answer is uh, partially is the uniqueness that they've been looking at. So basically you would say, give me two sets that they represent this binary relation, no? In, with a multi-aspected utility representation. Take all the utilities, transform them with an affine transformation. Actually, the affine transformation does not have to be common, okay? You will get another set that still represents your binary relation, okay? And in fact, so the operation you are hinting at is an operation basically of con plus constant, close convex on plus constant. This is the idea. And it's what now the jargon would say is the con of Dubra Macaroni Hawk. Okay, uh, so this is what they are doing. What instead I am doing uh, here, this is actually the normalization I choose with my co-authors in the paper I will present. We focus on this normalization, that is we want utilities that live, that are normalized, because we care in this representation. We care about this representation, the certainty equivalent representation, why? Because remember the example I was giving before, it's me, Fabio, and Mariano, and we are ranking investments. If we use expected utility and we just care in representing the committee preferences, let's say, okay, fine. But if we want to have this evaluation to be on the same page, that is with the same units, then we take certainty equivalence so that we could say Fabio gives to P a value of 300,000 euros. Mariano, 298, and Simone, which is always risk averse, 100,000, okay? So this is, the norm, this is the representation, with this reformulation. So here it makes a lot of sense to normalize them to zero, one, because otherwise, if you have a fine transformation of the same utility, when you go to the certainty equivalent, you just replicated many times the same uh, aspect of utility evaluation. Can I answer your question? Okay. 
we are moving toward the more the contribution part of this tutorial. So there's a, there's a lot of experimental evidence out there that tells us that the expected utility criterion is violated. So experimenters put people in the lab, they ask them to choose among risky prospects, okay? And typically, these choices cannot be reconciled by the expected utility paradigm. And in particular, these choices cannot be reconciled by, by using the expected utility paradigm, rationalized by using the expected utility paradigm, because they constitute violations of one of the assumptions of the expected utility uh, model, the independence assumptions. That's why, if you remember, I said surprisingly, reading this morning Aumann's paper, I thought he mentioned that completeness is arguably the most questionable of all the assumptions, but the literature, at least the experimental one, the best of my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, focus on the independence assumption. Here, clearly, I'm just giving you one of these evaluations, it comes from an experiment of Kahneman and Tversky, 1979. It's also called the Allais paradox, the common ratio, common ratio effect version. So basically saying, uh, you can, first choice, you can choose between A and B. A pays you $300,000 for sure, while B pays you a bit more, but just with probability 0.8. Okay, so you can also end up with nothing with probability 20%. Most of the people go for A. I will go for A. Okay. Now, people face instead C and D. You present people with a different problem. Now, with C, again, like in A, you can receive 3,000, but now with probability 0.25 and zero otherwise. D is like B, but now you receive 4,000 with probability 0.2. Okay? Actually, it is not hard to see or to show that C is a mixture with mixing weight one-fourth with the Dirac at zero. And similarly, D is a mixture of B with the Dirac at zero with probability, again, one-fourth. Okay? So it's exactly structured to devise a violation of the expected utility assumption. Sorry, Simone, just to, yeah. it's probably useful to say that they're allowed to choose just once. Once, yes, 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 sorry, just once, yes. So then, then most of the people exhibit this pattern of choice, A, D. They choose A in this problem and D in this problem. Why is this an issue? At the end, people have their own preferences, you know, we do not dispute over people's preferences. Sure, yes. But if they choose AD, they violate the independence assumption. You can show that they violate the independence assumption. Some other people instead, again, also B and C, it's a violation of the independence assumption. A non-violation of the independence assumption would be A here and C here, okay? This is not a violation of the expected utility. This violation of the expected utility is also called the certainty effect. That is, people here go for A, the lottery that has 3,000 in it, uh, because it's certain. So uh, basically, uh, certainty uh, is a premium for the decision maker, as extra appeal. Lotteries that deal with certainty have an extra appeal for a decision maker. On the other hand, here the decision maker reasons like saying, okay, here you mix the certain 3,000 with also getting the, with probability three quarter zero. So the certain, the 3,000 for sure lose, the, lose its appeal, okay? So violations are systematic and most of them are of the, of the AD type. So this tells you the message of this slide, I guess, is that we might want to drop the independence assumption. And people thought about this observation much more before me, because this comes from Kahneman and Tursky in 1979. Clearly, these slide of references that are models that get rid of the independence, notice the title of the slide, is just a partial list. Let me summarize a bit what this model do. Kahneman and Tursky, Quiggin, and Yari basically say, okay, the decision makers 
phase choices over probability distributions. Probabilities are to be seen, to be looked at as objective, but in reality the decision makers act in a behavioral way, let's say. That is, you, give, you tell them that an event has probability 0.2, but they distort it, and so they think it's probability 0.1. So they distort the probability you give them. They tend to overvalue unlikely events and undervalue very likely events, okay? Machina and uh, Becker and Sari say, of course, the agent basically, I'm just, you know, trivializing it a bit. Of course, the agent is not globally an expected utility guy, but locally he is. So if we look at small areas, small portion of the simplex, right there, the decision maker is an expected utility guy. Fishburne and Deckel and Chu instead look at weakening of the independence assumption, also called between us. And Chu, Epstein, and Siegel, and Gould, even them, they look at the particular, a particular weakenings of uh, independence. In their case, it's called mixture, mixture symmetry, and in this case, weak independence. Here, I propose a different approach. Okay. In all, in all fairness, Maccheroni 2002 will not, does not contain in the paper this interpretation, but it can be reread through the lenses I'm going to propose. And uh, the papers that I think do this are Cerea Violio 2009 and the joint work I have with David and Pietro in 2013. The perspective that I'm adopt I will adopt in the next, from the next slides on basically is uh, the equivalent for a problem of choice under risk of the perspective adopted by this bunch of authors in for a problem of choice under Knightian uncertainty, okay? So these last three bullet points were for the people who knew decision theory, in a sense, okay? So you can even forget about it if you want. So let's get serious. Let's get rid of independence, as promised. Just consider a, a binary relation that is a preorder, is complete preorder, continuous, and satisfies the weak monotonicity assumption. I can ask myself, can we retrieve a part of this binary relation which is standard? that is, it still satisfies independence. In other words, is the decision maker an expected utility guy for some of his choices? I mean, can I, rest, can I extract from the decision maker preferences the part where he is expected utility? The part of his binary, maybe this set is empty, maybe these rankings that are expected utility, and we will see in a second what I mean formally, are not there, okay? But can we do this? I claim yes, and I claim yes by constructing this derived object, Squ squiggle prime, which is a, a derived binary relation. I interpret P squiggle prime Q as the decision maker is absolutely sure, is confident, subjectively, that P is better than Q. Why do I use this interpretation out of this definition? Because I say that P squiggle prime Q, if and only if, no matter how you, mix, how you mix P with the fur lottery R, no matter how you mix Q with the fur lottery R, the decision maker will always go for the mixture involving P. So no matter how he edges, quote unquote, P with the fur lottery R and Q with the fur lottery R, P is better than Q. So that's why I interpret it as being the part of the rankings for the decision maker for which he is absolutely sure about, okay? The story, what is the interpretation? The decision maker is expected utility when he's sure of his rankings. Failures of independence arise in his behavior when forced to choose and he's not definitely sure about P being better than Q. That is another way of saying it. The decision maker is like in Aumann. He's expected utility, or in Dubra Maccheroni no. But you know, if you ask him an opinion, he does not always have an opinion if P is better than Q. He's not always sure. But if you force him to choose, that's where independence is failing, or might fail, okay? Let's confirm this intuition mathematically, because up so far they were just words. I define squiggle prime, but how do I know that it captures the part of the decision maker preferences that is expected utility? I know it, I could tell you the story because I have the theorem. So getting rid of independence. In fact, we all the assumption of the expected utility model, but independence. Then the following is true. If you define squiggle prime 
yes, you can represent it with a multi expected utility representation. Notice that whenever Squiggle Prime tells you that P is better than Q, you can prove that P is better than Q. That is, the interpretation of Squiggle Prime, the decision maker is absolutely confident that P is better than Q, is not brutally falsified. In fact, if he is absolutely sure that P is better than Q, then he's also sure, then declares P better than Q. What is point C saying? Let me translate it in words. It's just saying that squiggle prime is the largest subrelation of squiggle that satisfies the assumption of von neumann morgenstern but completeness. So it's capturing the part of the preferences that is expected utility. All the rest, allow me to say, the set difference is the non-expected utility part. Okay? This binary relation squiggle prime, of course, could be very coarse, of course. It could be very coarse. But at least this is the largest one you can take that is expected utility. Point D is giving you the functional characterization. So I should mention uh, commercial. <laughs> this is in the old paper of mine, uh, Cerevo 2009. OK, now at the end, we have quote unquote to survive. So without, you know, you put in the machine nothing, and nothing comes out of it. So we have to put something back to get something out of it. So we got rid of independence, but now let's get back some independence, okay? So I mentioned briefly and probably not satisfactorily that in a satisfactory way that in Kahneman and Tversky there was the certainty effect playing a role, okay? So how do we capture it behaviorally? Through this assumption of negative certainty independence, which is, was first proposed by David Dillenberger in 2010. Here, so if David, are you watching this video? Sorry. <laughs> I'm proposing a different interpretation than one he proposes in his paper. That is, though, coherent the path I took today. Okay? So first, let's read the assumption. He's just saying, look, the independence assumption has a bite only if the lottery that is dominated is a degenerate one. That is, the decision maker, if he can declare the uncertainty P, quote unquote, weakly better than the certainty delta X, then any mixture with P dominates any mixture with delta X, okay? So let me use the objects I introduced today to argue that this assumption is exactly structured to capture the certainty effect. Let's use squiggle prime. What is this assumption telling you in terms of squiggle prime? If the decision maker declares P better than the short outcome of X, NCI forces him to declare P absolutely, like confidently better. He can confidently declare P preferred to the, to the certain outcome delta X. Let's read the counter positive. Not because we are mathematicians, but because we are economists. And the counter positive is more revealing. If, if the decision maker cannot declare P confidently better than the short outcome X, if you force him to choose, he will go with the certain lottery, the degenerate one. In a catchphrase, when in doubt, go with certainty. Squiggle prime recall, I try to convince you, captures the decision, the part of the decision maker preferences for which he is sure, okay? So whenever I read P not prefer squiggle prime to delta X, I can say in English, P cannot be declared confidently better than delta X. So if you, if you cannot make this ranking com in a confident way, then it's gonna go for the certain lottery if he is asked to choose, okay? So that's why we think it captures the certainty effect. I give you my view, quote unquote. There is another way of reading this action without passing for squiggle prime, and I refer you to David's paper. So finally, the result I have with uh, David and Pietro. What is happening? So what do we do? Well, we did half of what I promised with the initial slide, getting rid of independence. We get rid of independence, but not of all the independence assumption, let's say. We retain the negative certainty independence. So just to summarize, same assumption of von neumann morgenstern but throw away independence, put back negative certainty independence. 
What do you get out of it? Let me read it. The decision maker in evaluating a lottery P satisfies this action if and only if, when he evaluates the lottery, he considers the certainty equivalent of this lottery. But now, differently from expected utility, he has a set of certainty equivalence evaluation. How does he aggregate this evaluation? With the if. So he takes the word. That is, let's go back, let's use a multi-expected utility interpretation as a committee. It's me, Fabio, and Mariano. We are evaluating investment prospects. But uh, Fabio says that P is better than Q. I say that I'm indifferent. And Mariano says that Q is better than P. We translate our evaluations into euros. And then we reach, we have to make a choice. How do we reach the choice? We say, okay, you know, the value of P is the worst, the most conservative evaluation among the ones of us three. Same thing for Q. And then, with this in mind, that's how we're going to choose between lotteries. Okay? Very good. So, how about uniqueness? Well, W can be chosen to also represent squiggle prime. And once you do that, it is unique up to the closed convex sum. Okay? So, you have the un Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, ambiguity of version is good at the settings. Yes. But uh, it depends. Which hat do you want to wear? If you want to wear the one of the economist, then this question has no. Each question is a good question. So it's a, it's a good question, but uh, you know what I mean. They are really different settings. In an ambiguity setting, probabilities are subjective, they come from your preferences, here they are the object of your choice. In a mathematical set, in a mat if you ask the, if you wear the hat, quote unquote, of the mathematician, it's a natural question. The connection, thanks for asking, is that's why I put GMMS. This could be reread, quote unquote, default to certainty of Gilboa, Maccheroni, Marinacci, and Schmeilder, but with the caveat, a conceptual one. Notice that the primitive here is not a, a pair of binary relation, is one binary relation, so squiggle prime is a derived object. There is some work to be done to show that, for example, just notice this. In, a spe in an ambiguity aversion, you go for the minimum of expected utilities. You don't take certainty equivalence. So there is for sure, how can I say? Let me rephrase it in this way. If you know GMMS 2010 very well, you could conjecture this result. But there is some work to be done. Conceptually, I think they are very different for the reason I described at the beginning. That is, if you were the economist at. at. Did I answer your question, Tomaso? Yeah. Both uh, Ansko Bauman and this setting are, you're, you're working in a mixer space, I am correct uh, or not? Uh, yes and no. So for example, this is what I, what I was, uh, is, a, is a problem that bothers me uh, since a long time. I'm not, if your question is again from, um, for, is the, your question can be rephrased in the following way. Let's forget about where these sets are coming. Let's look at Ascom and Auman and uh, the choice under risk in their bare mathematical structure. I'm in a mixture space. Can I do this exercise mathematically? And then I specialize it in these two settings. There, things take a different meaning, but the mathematical structure is up there. Like Ashton and Milner. When I go on Ascom and Auman setting, I specialize Ashton and Milner. When I go in under risk, I specialize it. I get expected utility, but they mean different things. Can I do that? No. Why can't I do that? Because, for example, uh, the exercise of Dubra, Maccheroni, and Oc, which is key here for me, because it allows me to represent squiggle prime with a multi aspect at the best of my knowledge, cannot be done in a, in, with, in a mixture space. Cannot be done, I should rephrase it, has not been done. Can I do it? I cannot do it. I try to do it, I cannot do it. So it would be. For, from a technical point of view, an, an interesting and natural question, but I, 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 don't know if, I, don't, I don't know if you can do it. Exactly because, basically, you cannot do Dubra, Maccheroni, and Oc there. 
you really need to have Bewley for ambiguity and Dubra Macaroni and Oak for risk. There is no Ashton and Milner that captures both of them. Yeah. You, for example, you can generalize it, uh, then I'll, I'll finish. You can, you can avoid to look at Crane's Moon and you just look at the Aumann Cohn and then you look, you try to prove that it's closed, uh, that it's closed. You can do it, for example, under certain assumptions of cardinality by using some results of CLI. But the most general setting that is the one you are hinting at, I don't know. Let me ask the last economics, the last question from an economic perspective. Fine. So, modulo the, the, the difference of the setting, this, uh, um, uh, this choice criterion has different uh, behavioral implication with respect to the, sure. I don't know, max, uh, max mean criterion. Max mean expected utility, of, of, uh, but let's be precise, of Maccheroni 2002. No, no, Gilbosch Meidler. Uh, I would say, I mean, I would say completely different. I mean, we are in different ballparks even. I mean, it's, we are in different, different realms, yes. Can, okay, go, go, Pierpaolo. I do not even uh, understand how they can be compared. I mean, uh, there is a matter of uh, commensurability. I think they, they are not commensurable. Uh. Yeah, I mean, you know, what you could do, for example, and then really I would like to finish the talk. What, imagine this, you are, you are Ascom and Auman, so you are expected utility over acts, but the way you, in which you evaluate the objective lotteries is with this. So then I could argue, I treat 19 uncertainty as if it was risk, but then when it comes to lottery, I'm the crazy CDO guy, okay? So. Did I, these, these examples, okay? Benissimo. Uh, ah, absolute risk attitudes. So how can I capture risk attitudes within this model? Well, ah, first of all, we call the above representation uh, cautious expected utility, okay? Well, why, why like this? Because several expected utility aggregated with the inf, so it's a cautious expected utility. If we do the exercise of Roche style Stiglitz here, that is we say, okay, assume the squiggle is a mean preserving spread averter. What can you say about the set W? Well, each element is a concave function. So remember, in expected utility, dislike in mean preserving spread, your unique utility function being concave. Here, it translates into all your utility functions being concave. Can we do comparative static exercise? Yes, we can do also comparative static exercise. That is, it means I can say what happened in terms of representation, if Pierpaolo is a cautious expected utility guy and I am a cautious expected utility guy, and I want to characterize Pierpaolo being less risk averse than me. Now, really, I think I have one minute or two minutes? Three minutes. So, it's not hard to see or to prove that if you are if you satisfy the assumption of a cautious, you are a cautious expected utility binary relation, you satisfy this assumption, which I called in my old paper mixing, but I should have called really preference for randomization, okay? And in fact, the slides is called preference for randomization. What does this assumption say? If you are indifferent between P and Q, Flipping a coin to the side among, between P and Q is weakly better than choosing directly P or Q. It's an assumption, if you wish, given the short of, you know, times uh, is precious and short, uh, it's an assumption of diversification, preference for diversification. You can show, again, that if you are a cautious expected utility guy, so you have a cautious expected utility binary relation, you satisfy this assumption. And if you satisfy this assumption, and uh, all the tenets of expected utility but independence, this means that your upper contour sets are convex. So finally, in the last two minutes, you can see why the title of the talk was Convexity and Risk, because up so far we've seen convexity but not from a behavioral point of view. Here we see it from a behavioral point of view. What does it mean behavioral in terms of binary relation? Risk, well, we've seen it since the first slide. Let me just tell you the representation. The representation, 
is telling you that, look, what you've seen in the minimum of certainty equivalence, okay, as, as a criterion, as a, as, as a utility function, as a story, yes, it's very peculiar and very clear cut when negative certainty independence applies. But in reality, is a property of convexity. Why? Because if a guy satisfy all the assumption of von neumann morgenstern but independence, and you replace independence with mixing, aka convexity, then your decision maker ranks lotteries according to this criterion. In evaluating a lottery P, it computes the expected utility. It distorts it in an increasing way. And then he aggregates all this evaluation by taking the inf. Okay? Here also you have essential uniqueness. Let me just add really two things and then I'll be done. Um, you can, as, as I said, you can show uniqueness of this object, okay? The usual decision theory exercise that I tried to motivate at the beginning. Things. Here, it's a nice exercise in duality, in uh, quasi-convex duality, particularly to prove the uniqueness of the dual object is, non, is a non-trivial exercise. And uniqueness is important from an economical point of view, not from an economics point of view, not for, because you want to say that U is an index of risk aversion. That is something that I can show. The second thing is that, okay, but if this model is a particular model of the one upstairs, the minimum of certainty equivalence, because this object U seems like a metaphysical object. And here it's the specification. The object upstairs, the minimum of certainty equivalent, you retrieve it from this particular function, function U that distorts expected utility evaluations by using the inverse V, okay? Maccheroni's model, the one that I was hinting before, which is a minimum of expected utilities under risk, can instead be seen as this particular specification of the function u. I know that this is just an illusion, like optical illusion that I put there, but trust me, I did the mathematics and also did the decision theoretic exercise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simone. We have Sorry, questions. I leave the conclusions up there because I always forget. The take home message is in the conclusion. <laughs> and then, yes. Then. Yeah, but please, 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 please. Ah, so, well, there are several experimental studies providing evidence for the violation of the axiom of independence. With uh, Pietro and David, we opted for the, cer for the certainty effect as a motivation. And we, from a behavioral point of view, we picked it up by using the negative certainty independence of uh, David, okay? And so we have the minimum of certainty as equivalent as a model explaining that particular behavior. One read of this model that is the message in a sense that I try to convey in the slides getting rid of independence is that we can see violation of independence as coming from the completion of an expected of in other way, expected utility binary relation. This is the novelty of this research project, okay? And uh, then uh, you can generalize this observation also to preferences that satisfy convexity. Instead, for the students, turn off the camera. <laughs> Decision theory is fun because often in answering relevant economics questions, it forces you to solve mathematical problems that are non-trivial, okay, and that are interesting per se. So that's why I like decision theory and econ theory in general, also game theory, because in trying to answer questions that have nothing to do with mathematics, sometimes you can do mathematics that is really exciting and fun, and otherwise I wouldn't do it probably. Turn on the camera again. <laughs> Goes on all the time, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. I, I, I'm. Little, still struggling a little bit with your yeah. interpretation. So this, there's this really fascinating idea that you can think of ind independence violations in terms of an underlying incomplete ordering. Yeah. And so your reading of that was something like we're, we're a little bit unsure what our preferences are yeah. over these things. So uh, just thinking of the, the, the sort of simple case, we just look at the Dirac's or the, as for the preferences over the underlying consequences. Well, those, because of monotonicity, that, that preferences, those preferences are fixed, right? So, that, that, 
So uh, le let me try to answer your question with two sub answers. I haven't quite finished the question, but maybe ah, you okay, anticipated it. So sorry, so sorry. No, 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 go, no, go no, but I mean, maybe you already see what it's saying. It seems like the preferences are already given, uh, so it's not clear how there can be uncertainty over the Dirac's, and if there is, okay, well, you do it. No, no, very good, very good. In fact, in fact, in very good observation. So, in fact, in this model, in this model, we forced, because I understand your observation, your observation is going really to the first, uh, first slides. It's saying, look here, you are already telling me that, uh, you know, your binary relation here has to be sure. This we see as a rationality assumption. Can I do this exercise with the, without this assumption? In the old paper of mine, Cherea 2009, yes, I do it without this assumption. Can I do the exercise with Pietro and David without this assumption? No. But because we are in a monetary lottery setting and all econo economists will see this as a, a, say, not too imposing question. Okay. From a mathematical point of view, why with Pietro and David do I need uh, this assumption? I need this assumption because otherwise I cannot even talk about certainty equivalence. I, I cannot uh, take the inverse of, I mean, I could have a utility that is concave shape, but not just in, is not increasing. I cannot take the inverse. It, it will not have a, a meaning. But you can, you can drop this one and force no, no assumption at all on the underlying preferences for which you are sure. So, I mean, just a, a suggestion alongside yeah. that, uh, I know economists don't like to talk this way, but another way of keeping monotonicity but still having the uncertainty is to say it's only the ordinal preferences that are sure. What you're not, you know, so you know you prefer $20 to $10, but how much better is $20 to $10? That's not fixed by monotonicity. And so when you, you might, one way you want to think about that question is what odds would I accept on a gamble that gives me oh. 20 Absolutely, absolutely. And so, sure, right? so, so absolutely. So I understand. So here, uh, how would you say, metron, Met metric, metric. So here we opted, if you wish, to use money as a metric. But if we decided to use, like von Neumann Morgenstern construction, on the other hand, probabilities, like uh, probabilities as metric that is uh, what is uh, um, how, what is the metric that that tells me how you evaluate the lottery p take the best outcome take the worst outcome tell me what with which probability you are indifferent between p and betting on the best outcome and on the worst on the bet that gives you the best outcome with probability lambda and the worst outcome with probability lambda then i can have an i have an answer actually you can write the nci assumption by replacing the constant the degenerate lotteries with the binary lotteries. And what you would obtain is the model of Fabio, a specification, I should say, of the model of Fabio, which is a minimum of expected utilities. And as a side remark, the intersection between the two models, that is the minimum of certainty equivalent and the minimum of expected utilities, is just the expected utility model. You can also show formally that. So yes, absolutely. As a follow-up, in fact, we are dropping this assumption by saying you can use another metric to measure your utility, quote unquote. I suggest that we yeah, move yeah, so further discussion to yes, yes. coffee and, and thank again Simone for his fantastic <laughs> report.